alongside developments in African American ministry and life of the Episcopal Church, we can look at the 1970s as the beginning of a conscience effort by the Episcopal Church to develop ministry to Hispanic, Latino, Latinx communities. This is something that's filled with promise as a possibility, but also has some tensions within its developments that we'll unpack here. In 1971, the Reverend Jorge Juan Rivera Torres is appointed the first Hispanic officer for uh, church programming for the presiding bishop John Heinz's staff. This occurs in the context of the Joan Convention special program. As the special program is uh, unwinding, uh, the Executive Council approves a charter for the National Commission on Hispanic Affairs in 1973. This is a commission designed to attend to the aspirations and ministry needs of Latinx people in the Episcopal Church. The commission was a recommending body. It generally did not make decisions on um, issues like grant funding or strategic initiatives of the Episcopal Church, but rather a program, uh, a program of the church that is a means by which church mission is executed but not as some sort of equal partner in governance or having a seat at the table insofar as one would want to develop a mission strategy, an evangelism strategy, a congregational development strategy for Latinx communities. This um, sense of being on the periphery of the structures of the life of the church is amplified by the elimination of the German Convention Special Program at the 1973 Joan Convention. So Executive Council meets early in 73 to approve the committee, the then CHA, and then over the summer, the special program is eliminated. Nonetheless, there does remain interest in the Episcopal Church for attending to these communities. So in 1975, there is the development of the National Consultation on Hispanic Ministries. This is a consultation developed in coordination with the NCHA, but is independent from it. Uh, the, this is a coordination across dioceses that have um, significant ministries in their life. And so they are in conversation with the NCHA, which is centered within the oversight of Executive Council. So um, the National Consultation on Hispanic Ministries focuses much more on congregational development evangelism and theological education, while the NCHA is much more of a grant-making body. While this is happening, the Episcopal Seminary of the Caribbean, located in Puerto Rico, is closed in 1975. Uh, this seminary had been really open for only about two decades, um, and its closure gives the sense that Latinx communities are to be dependent on centralized church systems for the development of their ministry and theological education needs. And so there's an expectation here now that Latinx ordinance would be educated in predominantly white uh, systems, that there's no space for creating a uh, Spanish language dominant uh, institution of theological education. The same year of 1975 is a tumultuous year for the church center staff. There's a accusation by the Federal Bureau of Investigation that Puerto Rican Episcopalians at the church center and with the NCHA, including uh, Maria Cueto, who is the first and only lay female officer for Hispanic ministries, are associated with um, bombings that occur in the New York City area carried out by Puerto Rican nationalists. So we have to remember that Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States, and um, in this time period, there is a uh, prominent and violent Puerto Rican nationalist movement. The accusations of, of uh, these Puerto Rican Episcopalians being part of this uh, nationalist movement, uh, the FALN, that's been carrying out bombings, 
leads to the suspension of Muir Cueto and then John Allen permanently removing her from her role as officer for her Hispanic ministries. Cueto herself is imprisoned twice for not complying with grand jury investigations. Uh, the church uh, does not really support Cueto in this. John Allen really distances himself from her. No pastoral support is seen as being given to her. And so her severance from church employment raises this question of institutional support of its minoritized members, even at the highest levels of the life of the church. In the mid-1980s, there is a renewed interest and reorientation of Latinx ministries within the life of the church with the increase of Central American migration that is caused in large part by the U.S. involvement um, in conflicts in places like Nicaragua and El Salvador and U.S. population growth of uh, Latinx communities, uh, whether it is in the uh, southwestern United States with Mexican-American populations or increasing presence in parts of the Northeast from Puerto Rican or Dominican populations. So a question begins to emerge, which is what does it mean for the Episcopal Church to uh, be in the presence of an increasingly diverse U.S. population and to only be operating with a racial understanding that mostly is a black-white binary. How does a Latinx community fit into an understanding of the Episcopal Church as a church that needs to serve a diverse U.S. population and not simply a black and white U.S. population? We can also add the presence of Asian Americans here and Native Americans, of course. The Diocese of, of New York uh, commissions the uh, great historian uh, Justo Gonzalez to uh, take a study of what Latinx ministry needs are in its context and how to address them. And Justo Gonzalez talks about the challenge of numbers. They're just changing demographic. And this is a discourse that is still is with us. And the challenge of the poor or the question of how does the church choose to be in solidarity with the people? Carla Roland Guzman, in her book, Unmasking Latinx Ministry in the Episcopal Church, writes that often the Episcopal Church goes towards dealing with the challenge of demographics, of saying, oh, there's increased diversity, how do we address it? And not the challenge of what the presence of increased diversity means on a more fundamental level the question of solidarity, the question of people who might not uh, inhabit the same uh, cultural assumptions, class assumptions, and so on and so forth. This is drawn out even further in uh, a document composed in 1988, a Hispanic manifesto, which is, uh, which is prepared in preparation for uh, the 1988 Joan Convention. This is developed under the leadership of Wilfredo Ramos Orange, who is later a suffragan bishop of Connecticut uh, and uh, later a provisional bishop in Puerto Rico. The document states, we aim to be and convert ourselves in a prophetic force in witness and service, serving the Hispanic presence inside and outside the life of the church by and for the Hispanic people. And so this is foregrounding the challenge of the poor that Gonzalez frames. And so the primary goals then for uh, Latinx ministry is meant to be service to the poor, the development of Latinx leadership and empowerment, and a calling on the church to advocate for things like immigration reform, to remove racial, ethnic, and gender barriers in the life of the church and to advocate for the self-determination of all people. Those are all positions of solidarity with a people versus a question of how do we convince this new group to enter our doors so we can count them as members. Yes, make them members, 
But unless you're in solidarity with them, this membership will be nothing, this membership will dry up. And so it's a question then of what is the potential, what's the promise for Latinx ministry in a white church? And we see this uh, addressed in a way in 1998 report of the Office of Hispanic Ministry written by the Reverend uh, Herbert Arantegui, who has uh, been a very influential uh, leader in Latinx ministry in the 1970s through 1990s. Uh, and I'm quoting this from uh, Carla Roland Guzman's book. It says, The church must insist on the freedom of all peoples to remain faithful to their cultural heritage, their particular language and traditions. At the same time, recognizing the reality that culture is ever subject to change. The church must take into account the diversity within the Episcopal Church. To me, this quote really resonates with a quote from 13 years earlier from the Codrington Consensus that I referred to in the previous video. It's a question of, is this a whites-only church? Or is this a church of all peoples, of all cultures? And if so, how is the experience of Latinx people alongside Black people, alongside Asian, alongside Native American, and alongside white European descended people. How do all those things get put into the center instead of putting one traditional experience of, Ang of Anglicanism in the center and the others on the periphery? Or as Carla Roland Guzman says, is the Episcopal Church willing to be evangelized by those outside of an Anglo-American cultural tradition? This is the question for the church. What will it receive from the fullness of its membership? Or will it only continue to pay attention to a strand of its membership? Oh, we, we can discuss this in more detail.